But can anyone seriously deny that many American politicians, including some American conservative politicians, also play this game? Or can we seriously deny that millions of Americans have developed rather inflated expectations of what government owes them in economic terms? Welcome to the Acton Vault Podcast, a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Gabriel Jaja, producer. You just heard Sam Gregg, Acton's director of research from our 2013 lecture series, speaking on his book, Becoming Europe, Economic Decline, Culture, and How America Can Avoid a European Future. In his book, Gregg explains how European economic life has drifted in the direction of what Alexis de Tocqueville called soft despotism and ways in which similar trends are discernible in the United States. You can find additional resources in the show notes of this episode, as well as previous episodes on our website at acton.org slash podcast. If you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Acton Vault is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Let me begin by saying that I've been rather humbled by the very generous response uh, that's been given to Tea Party, uh, to uh, Becoming Europe and it's still being given, I have to say, to, I'm very lucky to say, uh, to Becoming Europe. And interestingly, the generous response hasn't just been from Americans. When I lectured on this topic last week at Acton University, where we had more than 900 people attending, there were plenty of Europeans in the audience, and if anything, they were even more critical of the present state of affairs in Europe than I was. Uh, because, of course, on one level, Becoming Europe is certainly about what's happened to Europe and why it's now the sick man of the global economy. But obviously, I think the book's purpose is to point to some of the very similar trends that are now manifesting themselves, particularly over the past six years in the United States. And in some respects, I think it's, it's almost ironic that America is drifting in this direction because whether it's the colossal levels of public debt increasingly unaffordable welfare states, struggling banking systems, soaring levels of unemployment, especially youth unemployment, low economic growth, double, even triple dip recessions, ongoing violence, ongoing protests. I think there's a widespread sense that what Europe is experiencing right now is no ordinary recession. Instead, I think there's a sense that Europe's present economic crisis reflects some rather deeper traumas. And part of that trauma is an awareness that we're witnessing the crack up of an entire way of living an economy, an entire way of organizing economic life. And it's not primarily because of external pressures like globalization, but rather it's because of the inherent dysfunctionalities that are encouraged by European economic culture over a very, very long period of time. And as I like to remind students, recency and relevance are not the same thing. And all of this is to say that if America's economic culture continues to drift in the same way, we can assume that over time, similar trends are going to start manifesting themselves even more strongly than they already are in the United States. And that, I suggest, is what Americans mean when they use words like Europeanization, or when they say, we're becoming just like Europe. So this evening, I want to do three things. The first thing I'm going to do is explain what my book means by becoming Europe. The second thing I'm going to do is sketch where I think some similar trends are manifesting themselves in the United States. And third, in a spirit of optimism, I'm going to make some suggestions about how America might avoid going further down this path. Uh, but before I begin, let me make one qualification that I talk about at length in Becoming Europe. Europe is obviously not the same everywhere. Finland is not Belgium. Belgium is not Ukraine. Ukraine is not Spain. 
and nowhere is like Greece. Nor should we simply conflate Central Europe with Western Europe, with Scandinavian Europe, with Eastern Europe, with Mediterranean Europe. They're all quite different. Now that said, I do think it's possible to speak of a Europe and a European economic culture because of four realities. The first reality uh, is those influences in the old continent that transcend national, ethnic, and regional boundaries and which form a common cultural backdrop to contemporary Europe. Linguistically speaking, for example, there's always been a lingua franca in Europe, uh, especially at the level of elites. For centuries, of course, it was Latin. Then between around about 1700 and 1950, it was French, and today it's English. Another cultural commonality, of course, is the indelible imprint left upon Europe by 2,000 years of Christianity. And yet another element of common European cultural formation have been the various enlightenments. A second reality. A second reality is that for all their differences, Europe's economies have been intimately intertwined with each other for a very long time. Trade within Europe didn't have to wait until the 1957 formation of the European Economic Community to take off. The third reality, the third reality is the existence of the European Union as an identifiable political, legal, and economic entity. And the fourth reality is that sizable numbers of Europeans, especially among Europe's elites, they want Europe to be treated as a single economic unit. They want to promote a European economic culture that differs in some very important respects from what they perceive to exist in America and in the rest of the world. Now, I think a good place to start explaining what I call European economic culture, I think, is with Prime Minister David Cameron's February speech about Britain's future in the European Union. Now, that speech was about many things, including an attempt to bridge the growing ga gap between the Tory party's leadership and those people who actually vote for it. But the speech also mattered because it represented yet another missed opportunity for an important European politician to address a problem that's arguably even more fundamental to Britain's current challenges than taming an out-of-control European Union bureaucracy. And this problem is a problem of values, of attitudes, and of expectations. And as I illustrate in Becoming Europe, the prevailing conviction throughout most of Europe today is that the state, the state is the primary way in which we realize our obligations to one another that many of these obligations might be realized outside the political realm doesn't apparently occur to many European political leaders, including, I have to say, most center-right European political leaders. Now, in this regard, I've often wondered what a confirmed etatist like France's socialist prime minister, Francois Hollande, I wonder what he would think if he actually read a book authored by one of his compatriots almost 180 years ago. For although it's about the new world, Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America was not written for American audiences. It was written for Europeans. Now, I suspect Monsieur Hollande would be astonished to learn how the Americans observed by de Tocqueville how they dealt with problems that were beyond the capacity of individuals to address. 19th century Americans, Tocqueville noted, they addressed social problems through the habit of free association, primarily through churches, instead of simply expecting government officials just to step in. For Tocqueville, the contrast you have to understand with his native France was absolutely astounding. In his words, quote, Wherever at the head of a new undertaking in France you see the government in the United States, you will be sure to find a free association, end quote. Now, as no less than Adam Smith said, there are certain things that can only be done by governments. 
But the constant European equivalence of the value of solidarity with state initiatives, with government programs, and with public sector agencies is surely one of Europe's longest and biggest headaches. If only because such expectations justify the welfare state's endless expansion at local, regional, national, and European level. Unfortunately, however, it's not just most of Europe's political classes who think this way. Millions of ordinary Europeans share this attitude. Take, for example, Mr. Cameron's own backyard. Scotland is presently dominated by two political parties who rival each other at trying to be more social democratic than the other person. But Labour, the Labour Party and the Scottish Nationalists, they don't control Scottish politics simply because Scotland's Conservatives are completely inept. Instead, they are elected to Parliament by people who apparently want. They want social democratic policies, regardless of the long-term corrosive effect of these policies upon both the economy, but also upon society. Now, five years ago, I think it was, a former White House chief of staff famously reminded us, quote, you never want a serious crisis to go to waste, end quote. Its advice, however, I have to say that Europe's political leaders have declined to follow. Very few of them seem interested in using their country's economic challenges as a type of circuit breaker to articulate a bigger vision of why the economy and society needs to be liberated from states that have gotten way too big. Instead, they tend to present any proposed reform as a necessary evil that's embarked upon with considerable reluctance so that we can get back to the way things used to be. Now, I think one reason for this is that Europe's political leaders, they know, they know that appeals for greater economic liberty and smaller government simply don't resonate with enough Western Europeans. And in recent decades, Nobel Prize economists such as Edmund Phelps have illustrated the economic significance of a point about this made by de Tocqueville. And the point is this, that while laws and policies matter, they tend over time to reflect what the majority in a democracy want, for better or for worse. Now, like many other people, Phelps concluded a long time ago that contemporary European economies are generally less productive than the United States because of institutional factors, such as large welfare states and very heavy labor market regulation. And yet, Phelps thought, this couldn't explain everything. European countries, to use his phrase, were not a bunch of banana republics. Nor was it clear that they lagged behind the United States when it came to classic promoters of economic growth, such as rule of law. Now, Phelps' intuition was that the differences came down to America's economy being influenced by a culture that valued things like freedom and risk-taking. And he drilled down into data that surveyed American and European attitudes towards variables such as competition and freedom. And when he did so, he found that Americans have much more favorable views of these things than Europeans. So I came away, Phelps said, with the impression that what matters are the prevailing differences in economic culture. He even speculated that economic cultures can become so entrenched that it literally becomes impossible for people to think about any other alternative. He said, for example, that the French, having long ago despaired of having more freedom, have si simply learned not to care very much about liberty. Now, this brings me to the second part of my remarks tonight, which is how these attitudes are gaining ground in the United States. Study after study after study shows a remarkable shift away in America from positive views of market economies. To give you one example, in 2001, an international polling firm released the results of surveys into different countries' attitudes towards the free market. Now, in response to the statement, 
the free market is the best economic system in the world, only 19% of those surveyed in Britain agreed. The numbers were higher in Spain, 24%, and in Italy it was 21%, and they were, of course, lower in France at 6%. But the real shock came to be found in American reactions to the same statement. In 2002, so that's 11 years ago, 80% of Americans surveyed expressed a favorable view of free markets. But eight years later, that figure had gone from 80% to 59%. In 2002, lower income Americans had a 79% favorable view of the market. But by 2010, this is lower income Americans, the figure had dropped to 44%. And among young Americans, the numbers are even worse. Now, there's no doubt in my mind that these apparent shifts in American and European opinion, they owed a great deal to the 2008 financial crisis and the subsequent recession. But as I remind pe readers of Becoming Europe, there's always been, ever since the progressivist era, there's always been a strong strain of skepticism about the market in America, not to mention a considerable body of opinion that primarily associates concern for other people with action by the government. And this in turn, I think, points to a deeper problem that many European nations have long failed to master, but which I think America is now struggling to address. And it's a crisis that flows from a very, very unhealthy nexus between democracy on the one hand and the fact that many people in America now assume that they're entitled, as a matter of right, to be given any number of things by governments without too many questions being asked about how to pay for it all. Now, this combination, I think, is presently proving toxic toxic for much of Europe, but I think it increasingly constitutes a real danger for the United States. Now, as I suspect many of you know, the contemporary welfare state's origins go back to 19th century Germany. It was really first started by Otto von Bismarck, that great defender of freedom. But some of the welfare state's biggest expansions in Europe happened after 1945. Now, this shouldn't be surprising, given this yearning for economic security on the part of Europeans should not be surprising, given the fact that they'd been through two devastating world wars and the Great Depression. I quite understand why Europeans in 1945 weren't so interested in freedom, and they were much more interested in economic security. But was, what is, I think, surprising is just how quickly Europe's politicians recognize that the state's ability to provide social programs was a very effective way of building reliable voting constituencies. Now, governments of all stripes, on the left and on the right, they realized very quickly that they could attract support by making promises regarding things like pensions, retirement ages, subsidies, unemployment benefits, regulations, and of course, government jobs. Now, one justification, of course, for democracy is that it is a way for us to hold governments accountable to us. But here's the question. What happens when some citizens begin viewing democracy as a means for encouraging elected officials to provide them with whatever they want, including, apparently, limitless economic security by the state. And what happens when many politicians start to believe that it's their responsibility to provide the demanded security, or more cynically, start regarding welfare programs as a useful tool to create constituencies to vote for them? Now, I don't think anyone should be surprised by the end result. The end result is a spiral of expanding welfare and regulation that neither politicians nor the growing number of welfare beneficiaries have any desire to stop until things become so unmanageable that there's really no alternative. Now, unfortunately, 
in democracies in which many people regard the government as the primary provider of economic security, it becomes politically very difficult to engage in meaningful restraint of government intervention and government spending. Why? Because any politician who promises to reduce the scope of intervention is usually at a profound electoral disadvantage. As Luxembourg's Prime Minister Jean-Claude Juncker famously lamented in 2007, quote, we all know what to do, but we don't know how to get re-elected once we have done it, end quote. In other words, if enough people in a democracy want security through the state, regardless of the moral or economic cost, the capacity of politicians to oppose, for example, the desires of 51% of the population is very limited. Because to resist is, of course, to court electoral rejection or, as we've seen, rioters running amok in the streets of Athens. Now, it's of course very tempting to see all this as a peculiarly Western European problem. This is, after all, the continent in which the default position of even many nominally center-right governments are essentially social democratic when it comes to the economy. In other words, extensive government intervention is simply considered normal by most European politicians, including most on the right. But can anyone seriously deny that many American politicians, including some American conservative politicians, also play this game? Or can we seriously deny that millions of Americans have developed rather inflated expectations of what government owes them in economic terms? And I'm not just talking about those people who apparently regard any streaming of streamlining of social security as a, an apparent human rights violation. I'm also referring to those American businesses who now simply expect corporate welfare and who don't want any more to compete freely in the marketplace. So, having thoroughly depressed you, let's move on to the third and final part of my remarks. How can America break this nexus? Clearly at one level, it's essential to make long overdue, politically difficult decisions regarding matters such as government spending, government debt, and the welfare state. But I think at a more elemental level, we surely need significant attitudinal change. Somehow, governments and legislators have to stop viewing public finances as a vote-attracting tool. But my suspicion is they're not going to do that unless they sense two things. First of all, that the American people <clears throat> don't want to become like Europe. And secondly, Americans are willing to embrace what that actually means at the level of specifics. And yet, as Becoming Europe illustrates, even many self-described limited government conservative Americans, they balk, they hesitate when it comes to reducing the subsidies and regulations that specifically benefit them. So in that sense, I think the bigger challenge may well be for us ordinary Americans. To put it bluntly, we need to accept that our participation in democracy can't degenerate into voting for whoever promises to give us the most stuff. In short, if we're unwilling to use our democratic freedoms responsibly, America seriously risks becoming what one German academic once described as the situation prevailing throughout much of Western Europe. He called it fiscal kleptocracy. Citizens vote for those politicians who use state power to give their supporters what they want at other people's expense. And fiscally, that translates into tax increases, into no substantial spending cuts, growing welfare states, boatloads of corporate welfare and a colossal debt burden for our children. Welcome to Greece, welcome to Spain, welcome to Britain, 
but also welcome to the state of California, the state of Illinois, and the state of New York. There's a common theme there if you haven't picked it up. Now, America's founders, they understood that these challenges went well, well, well beyond the economic. Thomas Jefferson, for example, well, he was no model of personal financial rectitude. No model. But he understood the threat posed by excessive public spending and debt. To preserve our liberty, Jefferson wrote, quote, we must not let our rulers load us with perpetual debt. We must make our election between economy and liberty or profusion and servitude, end quote. Now, I think today our federal government and much of our Congress seems unable and in some cases unwilling to choose economy and liberty. But perhaps the more serious question facing the Republic is whether enough American citizens are willing to choose non-serfdom or whether they're happy to drift towards the failed project otherwise known as European social democracy. And at present, I'm afraid, the jury seems to be out on that one. So here, and here I'd like to conclude, how, how does America avoid further Europeanization? Now, on one level, I think it's a question of incentives. You probably have guessed, but I'm not a philosophical materialist. Unlike most people teaching in the academy today, I do believe there is a thing called free will. But it's also true that if incentives are aligned in one particular direction, it's much harder to persuade people not to go down that path. And the more that America moves in a more or less social democratic direction, the harder it's going to be to persuade Americans that this is not a tenable future. And that points, of course, to the importance of policies that incentivize people to be creative, to be competitive, and not to demand subsidies, privileges, and protection. That said, policy is important, but it's not enough. Those who want America to become more like Western Europe are, in my mind, they're generally much better at doing what I call the vision thing. They're much better at inspiring people to opt for or to choose social democratic policies, no matter how counterproductive such policies turn out to be. And to be frank, while I think that many conservatives in America and many free marketers in America are very good at policy, in fact, we're really very, very good at policy, some of us find it very, very difficult to move beyond efficiency arguments to articulate a vision for the United States that can rival the left's constant appeal to a thoroughly corrupted conception of social justice. Because there are such things as non-economic incentives. We often think of incentives primarily in terms of financial rewards, but incentives can also be non-financial. The desire to be good and to do good and be seen as a good person can sometimes incentivize people to act in one way rather than another, even if, objectively speaking, it's the wrong moral choice. So what does this mean? It means that if being seen as a good person by your peers is associated with supporting, for example, big welfare states, then some people will vote for big welfare states despite the fact that, economically speaking, it might not be in their best interest. Likewise, if the path to social ostracism lies in arguing that people should be encouraged and helped to take care of themselves and their families, then the incentives to advocate limited government are much, much lower. Now, if that's all true, I think it should radically reshape the ways in which we seek to stem and maybe even reverse America's economic Europeanization. Certainly, changing policies, changing the rules of the game is important if you want to alter a society's incentive structure. But I'd argue, I would argue that far more important change needs to occur at the level of people's values, 
attitudes and expectations. Because if, as I argue, economic life is indeed profoundly shaped by values and beliefs, by attitudes and expectations, then we need to do much more than just shift economic incentives. We need to make a normative case, a much stronger moral case for limited government and the free economy that goes far, far, far beyond the logic of supply and demand. Now, in the concluding chapter of Becoming Europe, I try to sketch out what such an agenda might look like. And I suggest that if values are as core to economic culture as I think they are, then Americans need to be clear about the value choices they must make if they want, that's a big if, if they want to avoid economic Europeanization. They have to choose, for example, to prioritize wealth creation over wealth redistribution. They have to prioritize accountability over falsehood. They have to prioritize rule of law over the rule of man. They have to pro prioritize property rights over endless redistribution and intervention. And even more fundamentally, they have to prioritize hope over fear and openness over defensiveness. So wealth creation, accountability, rule of law, property rights, openness, hope. In Becoming Europe, I try and spell out what these mean and how they affect our institutions and policies. But I also point out that these were, in fact, characteristics highlighted by Tocqueville as prominent features of the America that he encountered in the 1830s. But Tocqueville noticed something else. <clears throat> as perhaps his most discerning biographer, André Jardin, notes, quote, one of the first surprises for Tocqueville in New York was that at gatherings during the evening, one would rub shoulders with men who had spent the day in an office or a bank. Lawyers, businessmen, bankers. The pleasures of society came at the end of a day in which they had waged a fierce battle for profit." End quote. Now, you have to keep in mind that this state of affairs shocked Tocqueville. Why? Because the salons of his native France were dominated by government officials and gentlemen of leisure. Businessmen were largely absent from such gatherings. Now, this, I think, tells us something about the disdain with which much of 1830s Europe and 2010s Europe, I have to say, the disdain in which they regard, many of them regard, commerce and business more generally. But I think Tocqueville's observations also reveal something about America, that it was not as materialistic as many Europeans supposed, and which some Europeans today continue to assume. The pursuit of prosperity, Tocqueville found, was not, in fact, all-consuming of Americans' lives. Achieving economic success, in fact, gave Americans the time and resources to pursue other less material goods, fine conversation, the pursuit of knowledge, their children's education, philanthropy, charity, cultivation of the arts, and appreciation of beauty, and of course, prayer and contemplation of the ultimate realities. Now that's a vision that's somewhat at odds with the rough and ready frontier imagery that we often associate with 19th century America. Nevertheless, it's actually very consistent with the lives and aspirations of many of America's founders. And I think that the most economically successful founder of them all, and the last to depart this world, Charles Carroll of Carrollton, he exemplifies this. Now, as I show in my next book entitled Teak Party Catholic, due out September 1st, Charles Carroll certainly inherited enormous wealth. But Charles Carroll turned out to be, like his father and like his grandfather, to, to be a hard-working and immensely successful businessman. So much so that when his good friend, President George Washington, thought of making Carroll the American ambassador to France in 1796, Washington eventually decided not to do so. Carroll's devotion to his business affairs, Washington concluded, made it, quote, morally certain he could not be prevailed on to go. 
end quote. And yet, and yet none of his business concerns and the time and energy that they consumed, none of these things prevented Carroll from cultivating literary and other scholarly interests, nor did they stop him from long-term involvement in public affairs, whether as a legislator or as a political commentator or as a learned discussion of America's emerging constitutional framework or as a relentless fighter for religious liberty. In signing the Declaration of Independence, Charles Carroll put far, far, far more at risk, economically speaking, than any other of the signers. He was, after all, the richest man in America at the time. But Carroll's willingness to risk everything for freedom, I think, demonstrates something else. Carroll's conviction that more was at stake in America's dispute with Britain than just taxes, and that some things are, in fact, more important than money. And this, I think, all points to something else, and it's this. The need for conservatives and free marketers to embrace the argument that the end game of America's free economic system is not the endless acquisition of wealth. Wealth is a means, but the goal is human flourishing. That's an idea that's as old as Aristotle and Aquinas, but it's also deeply integral to the American founding and the aspirations found in the phrase life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, no doubt, part of the happiness is going to be found in the pursuit of the wide-ranging and often very uneconomic interests of a Thomas Jefferson or a Ben Franklin or a Charles Carroll. But other realizations of happiness can occur through the very pursuit of the means that allows us to engage such interests in the development, for example, of the moral habits that are so crucial for long-term success in business in a free economy. Now, of course, in much of Europe, a very contrary attitude has long prevailed. And this attitude is that if people are to live fulfilling lives, then as far as is consistent with maintaining minimal level of wealth creation, then people need essentially to be given things and they need to be protected from risk. Now, in institutional terms, that translates squarely into the European social model. What's interesting, however, is that there is very little evidence that such policies actually make people happy. As I illustrate in Becoming Europe, welfare recipients are, for example, generally less happy than those people who earn exactly the same income but do so through work. Now, obviously, I think you have to be very careful before you read too much into these studies. As the saying goes, correlation is not causality. They do, however, suggest, these studies do suggest that those economic cultures that prioritize redistribution in an effort to realize increasingly greater equality are less successful at helping people to flourish as they ought to flourish. Money, Ben Franklin once wrote, never made a man happy and nor will it. But how one achieves wealth most certainly does seem to matter when we think about something as profoundly unmaterialistic as human flourishing. So the truth is, I think, that economic cultures that are enthralled to the values associated with ever greater economic equalization, they tend to have rather materialistic comprehensions of human beings and human flourishing. Collectivist systems, of course, are an extreme example of this. But I think the American founders wrote better than they knew when they associated the word liberty with the phrase, the pursuit of happiness. Because it's in the exercise of freedom, including economic freedom, where a great deal of the happiness making actually occurs. Now, the downside may well be less economic security. But while economic security is important, it's not all important, and nor is it enough 
for human happiness. Now, this, I think, underscores the truth that if Americans want to resist economic Europeanization, they have to do much more than just engage in policy battles. The struggle to take back America's economy from those who have sought to realize the social democratic dream has to be much more than an argument about the relative efficiency of markets versus the European social model. Because man does not live by efficiency alone, and life is about much more than maximizing utility. As a society, America must consciously choose not to cut its economic culture off from the roots from which it's come. And those roots are certainly European. Yet these same roots have been refined over 250 years, 230 years, I should say, through distinctly American experiences. So much so that not even politicians as savvy as Franklin Roosevelt or Lyndon Johnson were able to pull them out completely. Now, sadly enough, there's no guarantees that these roots will persist in America. Economic cultures are like plants. Once you tear them up from their roots, they tend to die very quickly. Creating the values and institutions that promote market economic cultures is extremely difficult and history is littered with failures to do so. Americans, however, I think, can cultivate what they've been given as a sacred trust and as part of that broader civilization of natural liberty to which Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations pointed, and the heritage of which is deeply grounded upon what we should unashamedly call European civilization. And if Americans choose to do so, and frankly, choose they must, Americans can have confidence that whatever happens to Europe, something of Western civilization will not only have been saved, it will also have been renewed. Thank you. As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you like to hear more of. If you're familiar with our past content or have attended an Acton event and would like to see it in a future episode, you can email us at producer at acton.org. Until next week, for Acton Vault, I'm Gabriel Zsa Zsa.